afternoon. My name is Jean Tirol, and I'm very honored to be uh, chairing this panel, a uh, very distinguished panel. I'm not going to spend too much time introducing the participants. They are well known to you. So um, the first speaker will be Emilio Calvano, and then uh, Philippe Val, President Val, will be speaking, and then last, uh, Werner Stang for the commission. <laughs> And uh, Paul Belflam, unfortunately, cannot be with us today, uh, thanks to the strikes. <laughs> um, but I'm sure you'll fill in with your many questions. So first, we have three uh, presentations for about 15 minutes each. I'll make, a, I'll make a few comments. And we want to have plenty of time to be discussing with you. So we'll open the discussion to the floor afterwards. OK? So Emilio. So let me take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the Toulouse School of Economics for uh, financial support, and in particular, the Digital Chair uh, Initiative. Okay? So let me start with Amazon. Um, as we all know, Amazon is also a marketplace where sellers can go um, to sell their items. So this is the marketplace for this particular mop. This is a fantastic mop. Look how it cleans your car. They're actually, uh, believe it or not, this is one of the top 100 selling products on Amazon.com, okay? Now, there are actually six uh, vendors selling this mob, and if you wanted to have an idea of how price competition works in this pretty homogeneous product market, then you would just, you know, look at prices. Um, so this is data from uh, these marketplaces. So this is high-frequency data on the price that was charged by these six sellers over the course of 40 days uh, in the summer of 2015. So the scale here is in hours, so these are 40 days, and these are dollars, okay? And if you don't understand what's going on here, uh, that's actually normal, because what's going on here is that, um, is what we call a signature of algorithmic pricing. So this is basically software who is exploring at a high frequency, what would be the actual optimal price, whatever that means for selling this mob. And so prices here are changing as fast as once every 20 minutes, okay? Let me give you another example of algorithmic pricing on Amazon. This is a, what is it actually? It's a, <laughs> it's a lean trap. I mean, this is one thing that you use for your dryer. Um, it's also on the top 100 best selling list of Amazon. Um, and prices look like this. I actually cherry pick this because, um, uh, so here um, you're also seeing algorithms at work, but it's a different game they're playing. They're actually interacting. So over the course of almost a week, they were ramping up prices around the clock, 24 hours, every 20 minutes, and then there is some sort of price war, and then they start climbing again, and then price war, and then some more action here until they settle finally at a price uh, at about $10, okay? Now, the point here is that algorithmic pricing is a reality, and actually there is an industry uh, on Amazon um, that sells services to sellers who want to delegate their pricing jobs, okay? So if you type in on Google repricing software, uh, you would get a set of these vendors that claim to use uh, whatever artificial intelligence, cutting edge technology in order to get the most uh, profits from uh, your goods, okay? And actually, I bet that some of them do. Now, so what? Um, algorithmic pricing is not news. Um, airlines have been doing this since the early 80s. Um, but what happened recently is that advances in the field of artificial intelligence and statistics machine learning basically uh, created a new vintage of this algorithm, which are different in so many ways with respect to the one uh, we used to know. Okay. Um, 
just in a nutshell, uh, they're powerful, uh, they're versatile, and they're accurate. I'll come back to this in a second. And they're increasingly available off the shelf. So Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, they all sell versions of the algorithms that you can put in production in as little as one day. Okay. Now, what we study is a specific class of algorithms which is called Q-learning. Okay. So Q-learning algorithms were designed to solve what we call Markov, what economists call Markov decision processes or problems. Um, if you don't know what that is, just picture an agent, okay, who has to make a set of repeated choices. And before each and every of these choice is going to observe some information which is relevant from that cho for that choice. After the choice is going to observe a reward which is tied to that choice and now the world around him changes, okay. Now, the agent, um, it's basic, if you want to, in a nutshell, describe what this algorithm do, it, you know, it's very simple at a conceptual level. They explore uh, with the actions. They figure out which one work just by looking at the rewards. And then uh, they reinforce uh, those actions in the future. So the chances, actions that worked well in the past are played uh, with a higher frequency in the future, OK? Um, just. Um, for fun, um, let's look at applications. So this was a very influential uh, paper that was published on Nature three years ago now uh, by a group of researchers at Google DeepMind Lab. Basically what they showed is that a simple version of this Q-learning algorithm can learn to play Atari video games in that application better than humans, okay? Now here's the choice problem. I can actually show this to you if Jean gives me two, three minutes slack. Um, I think it's fun to see it. Okay, I'm buying time. Uh, let's see, you'll tell me later, okay? Um, so, while it goes, this is the algorithm which is learning to play, okay? While it goes, I'll describe the problem. So the problem here, the action that he has to take is whether to stay left, center, or right at each and every point in time. The input here is the screen, okay? That's a visual input. Um, so the algorithm is told uh, what is the color of each and every pixel on the screen, okay? Now there are a lot of pixels on the screen um, and each pixel can have 120 color. That was the palette back in the 80s. And so this means that there are 4.3 million uh, possible screens, which means that this algorithm has to figure out what to do in 4.3 million situations, okay? In a way that maximizes the reward. Maximizing the reward here means uh, you know, breaking this wall. And this is what they show. They show that in about two hours of training, they learn, and they learn even clever strategies. So the, in this case, uh, the algorithm learns uh, that if he digs a hole here, then he can put, he can send the ball up, and this is basically the most effective strategy for those of you who are familiar um, with this game, uh, to actually gather point uh, quickly. Okay, so, um, just another word, um, these algorithms, they don't know anything. So they're model free. So they don't know what a ball is, they don't know what a wall is. They just choose center, uh, right or left, and they get a reward for doing that. Okay. How do I go back to that? Okay, good. Um, good. So what we wanted to do, we want to understand uh, we wanted to apply this to online commerce, and in particular, we're interested in whether this intelligent pricing algorithm can actually learn to maximize profit, which in that environment would mean learn to collude. Um, we ask whether algorithmic collusion is any different than collusion between humans. If yes, how you do, do you detect it? And then um, I'm gonna discuss policy approaches to this problem, okay? So what we did, this is just a probe, okay? Take it as this, it's a probe, this is a long-term project. So what we did was basically an experiment, a simple one, to check if, if you know, it makes sense to go on. Um, and I'm just gonna show you these this results here, preliminary results. Um, so what we did, we coded two of these agents and we let them play our game, okay? So our game is what we call a pricing game. Hmm? So the idea is that these two agents, they will have to choose prices for a number of periods. And in particular, in this experiment, they have to choose between high price and low price. What they observe is what the other agent did in the last period, okay? Now the payoffs, if you've been looking at them, are structured in a way that there is a common interest in keeping prices high, 
but in an individual interest in undercutting your rival and charging a low price, okay? Uh, now, this is a complex game, okay? So we basically want to test whether this algorithm can learn collusive strategies. Now, a collusive strategy is a strategy in which there is a punishment phase, okay, and a collusive, and a cooperative phase, okay? So basically what they have to learn, they have to learn to punish. Punishing means sacrificing the short-term payoff in order for the long-term gain of getting uh, the collusive uh, monopoly uh, payoff, okay? So um, how do they did it? Hmm? Now, <clears throat> what I can tell you is that they did quite well, actually. We were surprised by this result. Um, in 52% uh, of all these, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you that we do this for 1,000 experiments, and each experiment is 1 million um, games each. 52% of these experiments, these guys, they actually learn to play a collusive strategy, okay? So another way to say that there is a lot of high prices in this game is that in 64% of 1 million times 1,000, it's 1 billion iterations, these algorithms were charging high prices, okay? And the convergence to these collective strategies was actually pretty uh, fast. Now, another way, another nice thing of doing uh, simple experiments is that we can actually understand exactly what's going on. So here I want to show you a bit how they reason, okay, in a, in a way. So what you're looking here is time. Okay, so these are the number of um, repetitions or interactions, so to speak. Um, and what this graph shows you is basically what are the incentives to defect uh, when you are in a cooperative phase. Okay, if this is negative, then it means that the algorithm is actually understands uh, that the present value of doing so uh, is lower than zero. So they'd rather cooperate when your opponent is cooperating than defect. Now what's interesting about this graph is that it shows you that um, in a sense, um, first of all it shows you that there is fast convergence at the beginning, okay? Um, towards these negative values, and second of all, that from time to time there are some price wars, okay? So these price wars basically are the price that they have to pay because they're experimenting, okay? So remember that from time to time they won't do the collusive outcome because they want to check what happens if they do something else, but when they do something else, sometimes they, t they trigger price wars, and so they have to start learning again. So, um, you know, this is just one way that uh, we use to uh, try to understand uh, how they work um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what can we uh, do about it, okay? Now, the key features in the last three, three minutes are, uh, so there is no instruction in the code whatsoever to coordinate or collude, and this collusion is achieved without any form of uh, communication, okay? Now, Again, this is a simple game. We're not drawing any conclusion for this. The only th conclusion that we're drawing is that we should spend more time investigating, okay? But suppose that we find evidence that indeed uh, algorithmic collusion is a problem. How do we tackle it? So my last three slides are on a policy approach. So one thing that we could do is just stick to the current policy, okay? Um, what would happen then? Now clearly here, there is no intent no mutual agreement, no meetings or mind or mutual understanding whatsoever on cooperation, right? The algorithms don't even know that they're playing against each other. And whoever chose those algorithms, they did so because they were promised to maximize profits, okay? They were not necessarily seeking any sort of collusive agreement. Um, so the current legal definition of collusion should be in a way updated. But also the evidentiary standards have a problem, right? Because right now what we're looking at, uh, you know, what we're trying to find out is, uh, is evidence, communication, explicit agreements. But again, here there is none. Um, the presumption that is challenged here in a way is that it's very difficult to achieve collusion without communication, okay? And, and so, Sticking with current policy is a bad idea because under current policy, this would be perfectly law, okay? Now, the second thing that you could do is what we call the sandbox approach. is a regulatory ex ante approach. And the idea is 
you know, whenever a new product is on the market, say the Q learning epsilon greedy deep algorithm, then we try it out. We test it in a synthetic environment. We see, we don't see anything in the code that suggests collusion. But what we see is the kind of strategies that emerge from having this code interact with other codes, okay? And if those strategies have a flavor of something that we do know, collusive strategies, then we blacklist them, okay? This is something that we could do. Uh, Har Joe Harrington is one of those who proposes this approach, and then there are also legal scholars who, fa who would favor this. Now, the problem, if you want, is not only that this is very intrusive, but it's also problematic to implement because you know, something that works well today might turn out uh, bad tomorrow when it's interacting with some sort of new innovation on the marketplace. But then how do you retroactively blacklist something on which you know, there's been heavy investment in production? So again, it's an option. Um, maybe uh, we should discuss it. Um, another thing that we could do is just stick with the ex post intervention but sort of rebalance uh, the, um, uh, reconsider the balance between explicit and tacit collusion accounting for this sort of higher rate of false negative. So finding better tests that would fit uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, problem. Okay, and I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure and an honor for me. Remind me uh, that I was an economist one day to speak in front of you. Uh, my first point is that I think that for economists like you, uh, La Poste is a perfect Schumpeter case. It does mean that in our group, we have business which are in attrition, business which are slowing down, business that are on birth and business that are in acceleration. So we are a perfect Schumpeter case of business. All our objective is very clear, to reinvent, to refund the old postal business model. And in doing that, we are more and more crossing platform in our business life. That's why we're saying that uh, working with platform, working for digital platform, is clearly a big strategic issue for us, which is leading us to this question, should this platform be regulated or not? My second point is that we are living with uh, a specific platform named Amazon, I don't know if you heard about it, <laughs> but uh, you will see that our position toward Amazon is something very complex. Let's take the time to think that through. First point, Amazon is our first client. Thank you. Which does mean, which does mean that Amazon in, is bringing us million and million of parcels which is just giving us the revenue to employ 253,000 people in the world. So thank you, Amazon. And at the same time, Amazon is becoming more and more our first competitor, which is not so often seen in the traditional business to have your first client becoming your first competitor. And from the Amazon case, we can see very positive impact and some questions. What are the positive impact? It is the convenience for the client, for millions and millions of clients, maybe you. The second one is the quality of service, a huge level quality of service, which is stimulating us, which does mean that we have 
a room of improvement for our postal services, and also this fantastic ability to innovate everywhere. That are the very positive effects of Amazon for everybody, for the whole society, and also for La Poste. At the same time, there are some questions. And as it is a client, I will not speak about negative impact. That are questions. What are the questions? The first question is the financial power of those platforms in the world. They are becoming, those five or seven platforms, the biggest companies in the world. And in five years, it will be the case, I think, uh, Chinese and American, American uh, companies, will, the digital companies, will be the biggest company in the world, which is not a concern, but which is something like a question. The second thing is the market power, which is in the hands of the platform. And from my point of view, it is a big issue, not only for the company I am in charge of, but also for economists like you. Because when there is a concentration of power, it could, in the human history, lead to an abuse of this concentration of market power. That's why, leading to my third point, we think, and I am telling you and sharing our view on that, that those platforms should be regulated, not by ourselves, not by ourselves, by the European <laughs> Commission, <laughs> by the judges. But I think that we could not just rely on very positive impact of those platforms to say there is no need of regulation. There is, from my point of view, obvious needs of regulation because of the market power in the new digital paradigm that those platforms have uh, reached. How to regulate, we don't have to say how, because we have a clear, not common interest in this question. However, ex ante, ex post regulation, there is a need of regulation. And I think, and thanks to Jean Tiron and his team, and the team of TSE, we are working on that. Key question for the future, what is the best regulation for common good for this platform? I think it's something which is really not only a big issue, but intellectually, something which is very, very interesting, very interesting. I don't know how, but there is a need of regulation. Clearly, my, f my first point is that to regulate or not could be questioned. I am in favor of regulation, but I am leading La Poste, so I have clear interest for a good regulation. There is a point where I think it is no question. <coughs> it is the tax element of the regulation. Because as we are competing with Amazon, we have to see that they are not paying any tax, not, not tax, but a very low level of tax in comparison with La Poste. And as they are becoming more and more our competitor, you think that you can see that this is a big issue for us. We are paying taxes and we are happy for that, and more taxes are more happiness for us because it would mean that we are making more money, which is describing us as a really sustainable development company. But at the same time, some competitors are not paying taxes. And clearly, that is a big issue. The good news is that not only the French government, but also the European Union is going in a di direction to set up a tax framework for those platforms. Because that is really hurting the competition and the fair competition. So in those four points, 
I explain and I try to share with you what we are doing in changing our business model, entering in the digital era, and not only in the digital era, but in the digital business. Those businesses need to be regulated, especially on the fiscal side. In my conclusion, I will not quote an economist, but uh, a very young uh, man who in 1548 wrote, from my point of view, a key speech. <coughs> His name is Etienne de la Boétie. I don't know if uh, the non-French of you know Etienne de la Boétie. And if you don't know, clearly this night you have to read <laughs> what he wrote at the age of 18, and which was the speech of voluntary servitude. This is a key speech, a key note in the human history. What is the relationship with digital world? You will see. Etienne de la Boétie is telling us, the human beings, that if there is a servitude, it does mean that people have chosen this servitude. And the digital platform has given us convenience, a lot of convenience. My question, and please, uh, I ask you to follow my advice to read this uh, speech for voluntary servitude. My question is about the price of this convenience. We have more convenience thanks to all those platforms. We have more services. What is the price in terms of freedom? Sharing intimacy, sharing data. So is there not a voluntary servitude in the digital world? That will be my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we know what the European Commission is going to do. Werner Stang is uh, head of unit of uh, e-commerce and online platforms, if I'm correct. And he's going to tell us about what regulation is going to look like. OK. <coughs> Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so online platforms, that's my, my passion and my profession. Uh, it's just fascinating. I mean. Uh, what platforms have been doing to our lives and will be doing is just, it's just uh, fantastic and scary at the same time. Now in my sh short intervention, 15 minutes, I was told I'll do three things. First, a few words about the platform economy, some characteristics. Second, some challenges that arise from that and what the Commission or Europe is doing in general about it. And thirdly, very specifically on a policy proposal, a uh, proposal for regulation that comes out next month, end of April, uh, where we're trying to set some framework conditions for relations between business users and platforms, so unfair trading practices in the platform world. Now, starting with the platform's economy as such, I mean, this, this is a, a room full of economists. I don't have to spend much time on this, um, but we all know what the platform's economics looks like, uh, about the multi-sided markets, the, the speed and ease with which they grow, uh, this, the, the network effects, the importance of having more users each time on every site to attract even more users, the extent to which this is further accelerated by data, network effects, and the results that we all know is, of course, that uh, often referred to as the winner takes all uh, principle that you would in specific sectors of the economy have one, two, three maximum really successful platforms. Now, this is just an observation. <coughs> it's not a problem yet. Uh, because as also Mr. Vaughan has rightly said, there's of course numerous advantages arising from that. So also in Brussels, in, in spite of probably even an avalanche of policy initiatives that one way or the other tackle the platform phenomena, we don't have an anti-platform reflex or rhetorics here because platforms have in immensely contributed to, to, to welfare, if you want, in, in many different regards, already from pure market uh, language 
uh, the way in which, which they have made many markets much more efficient by, by bringing supply and by matching supply and demand much more efficiently than has ever been the case in the past. I mean, when I grew up in Austria uh, quite some years ago, uh, there, there was no internet. And uh, even when I lived in Vienna, in the biggest city, uh, I just had the choice to go to three or four or five relevant shops. And what I got there, I got. Otherwise, I didn't even know what existed elsewhere nor would any supplier from Toulouse have ever gotten me as a customer sitting back home in Austria. Now, as we all know in many regards and in many different fields of the economy and society, those platforms have been bringing together people. That's good for businesses. That again, talk about this small uh, Toulouse-based, uh, uh, small and small and medium-sized enterprise could never actively go out and serve 10 other countries in Europe, let alone uh, across Europe doesn't speak the language, doesn't know the market, doesn't have the logistics, uh, in spite of La Post, um, doesn't have any ability to deal with the after-sales services elsewhere, uh, what about returns, and so on and so forth. Now jumping on eBay or other platforms allows those SMEs to go out and sell to many more. Uh, consumer, we don't have to talk about the consumer. Uh, also Mr. Val referred to the convenience, how easy it is for us to, to, to buy on Amazon and to communicate on WhatsApp and to go on Facebook and see our data share. But who cares about data sharing? We discussed this over lunch when I talked to my, my teenage daughters. They don't give a damn about Cambridge Analytics. They don't, then I don't know where Cambridge is, not what anal analytics means. Um, all, all they have care about is the ease with which they can, can communicate with all their friends. So lots of advantages, but at the same time, of course, there are lots of challenges, and we are fully aware of those. Uh, again, starting with economics, um, on the one hand, those platforms have increased competition through, through this um, matchmaking and greater transparency of supply and demand. But then, of course, the two biggest issues are market power on the one hand and the information asymmetries on the other that put at risk that markets function uh, as efficiently as they should. Now, just a few challenges in what, what Brussels is doing. Uh, of course, you have this concentration. Winner takes it all, concentration, increasing dominance of some players, yet they may not reach any thresholds under competition law. What is a relevant market? When are you really dominant? How much are data worth? There are lots of open issues there, uh, which also had a very interesting presentation from Emilio on the limits of competition law when it comes to collusion, where nobody actually intends to collude. That's already where competition law enforcement ends. Uh, you saw Brussels going forward against platforms. I mean, Vesta, the Commission of Vesta, has been quite active with the Google case and Apple taxation and, and Amazon and so on and so forth. But there are limits for competition law. There's a lot of talk about level playing field, fair competition. And there are some, and I will come to this proposal of next, uh, next month in a, in a minute. There are others as well as the copyright reform. It's about the fair remuneration of rights holders. Uh, if this, their stuff is being sold on YouTube without them getting any money for that. There is the issue of audiovisual media services that are strictly regulated, the old television, you know what they can send, what they can, um, what they can show and what they can't show and when and how much advertising is allowed and when, whereas all the social media, of course, can, can pretty much do what they want. There's the taxation discussions, very, very important. Digital taxation is being discussed by, by member states as we speak. Uh, sort of should the taxation be due where the value is created or where the company is established and taxed. Uh, and some other examples. Um, also society, of course, we had interesting presentations this morning uh, on, on fake news or on illegal content, hate speech, terrorism, and so on and so forth. So how do we deal with those issues? At this stage, it's much more on the soft law side of things in Brussels because someone mentioned this morning censorship and things like that, very, very delicate issues. Uh, data protection was mentioned. Yeah, we have the GDPR and the e-privacy directive. Um, we have consumer laws um, that are also meant to protect consumers. There's a revision of consumer laws as we speak. Uh, for instance, that when you go to a platform as a consumer, you should be much clearer from whom you actually buy. Do you buy from the platform, from the third party seller? What happens in terms of liabilities and so on and so forth? Uh, so there are lots of things going on and I'm skipping uh, lots of those. What we're doing next month is looking into the relations between the business users and the platforms. Because those platforms, obviously, with the growth of the digital economy, generally speaking, the digital world is growing, and within that, the platforms are growing. And with that, the dependence on those platforms is growing to reach your customers. And that is either you are an e-shop or, or some shop, some, somebody <coughs> selling stuff, e-commerce, and you sell it through a platform like Amazon or eBay. 
or your hotel, and to be seen, you need to be on Booking.com or Expedia. You're an app developer, and you need to be on, on Google Shop or on the App Store. Um, but also Facebook, increasingly turning into a marketplace, and for many businesses to reach customers, they need Facebook to reach, that's where the customers are. So there's this dependency, and at the same time, of course, this imbalance in power and size. And compared to those platforms, even large companies are dwarfs. But when I worked on postal issues a few years back, I thought La Poste was big, and I was defending the sm your small competitors against you. Uh, but now if I deal with the Googles and Amazons and Apples and Facebooks of these worlds, all of a sudden La, La Poste becomes not so big anymore. Or Spotify, you know, against Apple. Um, of course they are dwarf and highly dependent on Apple. So we're looking into these imbalances and dependencies uh, and we're starting from a contractual relationship point of view because those platforms have terms and conditions. You are now a business that uses, that needs that platform. You're not negotiating terms and conditions with them. Apple is not changing their terms and conditions for you when you come as a new app developer, nor would Booking.com do that for a small Toulouse-based hotel. So you have to sign up to those terms and conditions that don't give you any rights, lots of obligations. Um, and if you don't like that, you can go to court in the US. Um, so we're starting from there. And what you will see next in next month's proposal, it is still probably not going f far enough for some who would want a much, much more muscled intervention. We are starting from the basis of that we know the problem, but we're not entirely sure of the solution because it's a very two, these are two very different things, establishing an issue out there, but then coming with a policy response that does more good than bad. I mean, that's the art of, of lawmaking and we constantly fail in this, I guess, uh, inevitably. So we are, we are cautious. We're starting with transparency. I told you at the beginning, it's market power, which is the driver, and transparency, which is part of the solution. So we want to increase predictability, that for business users signing up to a platform, it is much clearer who that platform is, what that platform does, how it interacts with you. So they have to have clear terms and conditions. Well, it's obvious. Well, it's not actually, but that's part of it. They have to be very clear terms and conditions. Once they change them, you have to be notified in advance, not overnight, but you have two weeks to adapt to this. Um, you have to have some basic information on how ranking functions. Of course, we're not asking platforms to reveal their algorithms. That would be counterproductive and many other good reasons for not doing so. But some basic understanding of what is it that determines ranking. If I'm a hotel and I'm on booking.com, what are the key parameters used by booking uh, that I know, especially if they are paid for mechanisms, for instance, yeah, there's a preferred partner program. What if I sign up to that and pay a bit more commission? What does that actually mean for, for to be found? And then these days, it's you need to be found on the internet. Yeah, uh, We want basic transparency on data, policies of the platforms. We're not asking them to share data. Many ask for this. Yeah, We want data from the platforms. Uh, I don't have the time to go into the reasons why this would be very delicate and dangerous, but still we want platforms to be crystal clear about what data they share, don't share, on what basis they share them. Same for discrimination, one of the biggest concerns where platforms are not only intermediaries, but compete with their third party uh, business users. There is of course a big risk that they could use their privileged knowledge data, artificial intelligence, we've all heard of that, to the detriment of business users. Again, here we want platforms, not only we don't want them, we force platforms to be, to be much more clear in what ways they may and they may not give preference to their own services compared to other services. So we're not saying you're not allowed to do this, or do that. we're saying if you do give any type of preference, that has to be spelled out so that it can also be watched more easily. The second pillar, and I'm coming to, don't worry, to the, to the end in two minutes. Uh, the second pillar of our intervention next to transparency uh, is redress. What if things go wrong? So you, are, you suffer as a business user from some practice of a platform um, you're not going to go to Silicon Valley or to Seattle to, s to, to go to court there, especially not as a European SME, I guess. Um, so we want first uh, a better internal complaint handling system. There must be a mechanism whereby when you face a problem uh, that you can turn to that platform and within 48 <laughs> hours or so, um, a solution can be found. Uh, that's very important. Take, take one example, which is the most harmful practice we've experienced. That's delisting. That means you're no longer on that platform. I mean, that can be deadly, of course. If your turnover depends 80% on platform X, and platform X closes your account, 
doesn't really tell you why, doesn't give you any remedies how to address this. And this happens four weeks before Christmas. It is not an invented example, it's a real example. That can be the end of your business. If you're an app developer without an app store, you're also dead. So this, therefore, we are saying within the terms and conditions, you have to spell out clearly the rules of the games. Welcome to my shop, but if you do one, two, two, three, or four, you will be out. That must be clear up front. Now, when you do delist me, now I need, you will need to receive an immediate information on the grounds. You say, I took your shot on your shop because you sold counterfeit products. Now, if you did sell counterfeit products, you're probably going to shut up and try to sell them somewhere else. But if you didn't, uh, then at least you have access to this quick uh, complaint handling mechanism. You can go back to them and not just, you know, sometimes you receive an email triggered by a robot decision taken by an algorithm. There was not even somebody sitting at, in the, bo at the board of Amazon and says, well, we're we going to take her down. <laughs> yeah. It's much less spooky or more spooky. Uh, so therefore, finding a mechanism to discuss this quickly and show some evidence. No, I didn't do that. And then you're back up again. It's in the mutual interest. Second stage, we promote mediation. So if that doesn't work out, that there is some independent mediation possibility <coughs> in Europe uh, to do this out of court, because access to court, not only whether it's in the US or here, court is always expensive, takes always a long time, and there's a huge fear factor. The number of businesses and associations that have talked to us saying, we don't dare to complain, because we are dependent on that platform. We don't even want to know for them to know that we are complaining. Uh, so therefore, they also won't go to court, but probably they won't, will go to mediation. If they don't, we're going to introduce a mechanism of collective redress whereby associations on behalf of their members can take a platform to court for non-compliance with our regulation. So not to sort out an individual contract issue. Uh, so there's some enforcement element. And the third, and with that I'm closing, that's also relevant to, to anybody here in this room and to this sort of events where we're trying to, to increase knowledge of what's going on. That's why I welcome such events very much. Uh, it's, it's an observatory, it's monitoring, it's watching, not only the implementation of our regulation, but the platform economy as such, what's going on out there. Uh, even the things that we only regulating at the transparency level today, discrimination, data, <coughs> algorithms, and so on, uh, that there will be much more monitoring of what actually happens on that market, what the effects are, which would then allow us in a couple of years' time to come back uh, with much more certainty on finding the right answers to problems that we already know today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Werner. Uh, this presentation has given us a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, let me comment a little bit on that and then we'll open the discussion to the floor. Uh, let's start with Emilio's uh, paper. It's there is very little work on algorithmic pricing and, uh, and the impact on the collusion and what it implies. Um, as you know, uh, the theory of collusion in economics is kind of rational collusion. We, you know, the assumption we, t we make actually is that the firms actually, f if there is an opportunity for collusion, they find a way of, of colluding. So they already reach uh, this, this level of optimal collusion. Actually, if you look at the guidelines, uh, for example, the merger guidelines, and you, you read what might be conducive to, to collusion, actually, to tacit collusion, they actually take a rational perspective on that, and actually a number of people from Toulouse actually have contributed to those guidelines. Um, we know much less about what happens when people don't find a way to coordinate, and that's, that's where it steps in. Um, now, there are two things to be distinguished. The fact that uh, you monitor in a continuous time almost. Of course, you can react much more quickly. And also the fact that you have stat statistical algor algorithms that help you uh, solve the signal extraction prime because when you see your demand decrease, it might be the case that uh, there might be some secret price cut from the others and in the case in, in which you don't observe prices or it might be a demand shock and so on. And all that you can do that very quickly and more accurately so that should favor collusion, but it has nothing to do with AI in a sense. It has to do with computer, but not with AI. Um, and actually, I will say, you know, if, if the algorithms work well, which is a little bit your conjecture, um, it's going to bring us closer to the standard economic analysis in some way. 
Now, uh, in practice, you know, the, those games are played by humans or algorithms, so humans have only limited capability, um, limited intelligence, um, and they behave irrationally. So, for example, you could have hyperbolic types who actually want to make money right now, as opposed to re revengeful types who actually are, are willing to you know, to bear a loss for a long time. So if they are, you know, it's, it's complicated to predict human behavior in some way. Um, and they probably use uh, simpler strategies than algorithms, right? Uh, also, um, they might use tit for tat or very simple things like that, which actually may apply to your, to your game. Uh, it's easier to learn, but they also have a harder, harder time to learn themselves. So we know very little, so I, I found that very exciting that uh, you and others are working on the topic because you know, again, we know rational collusion, but you know, this kind of stuff is, is still a new world. Um, on the presentation by Philippe and, and Werner, um, so you start, of course, from the point of view that we have more and more monopolies uh, nowadays. I mean, that's a technological fact, uh, direct and indirect networks than it is. And uh, that means that actually uh, much of what we knew about regulation is actually obsolete, unfortunately what has served us well for 100 years. Uh, now, you know, the, the kind of uh, market definition, price regulation, uh, profit regulation, and even structural policies have gone down the drain. Uh, structural policies, I mean, is actually a difficult thing. We have to reinvent that because it, it's easy to break up some kind of electricity company, right? You know, there is generation, transmission, and distribution, roughly, you know, and still it takes years. Uh, but, you know, nowadays it's very hard actually uh, for most, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but for most to actually break up things, uh, technology is moving very fast, and it uses the data, so all the services use the same data also. So it's, it's not that easy to, to break up the, the firms. Also, we could also monitor acquisition a little bit more, I mean, we are talking about Amazon, you know, Instagram, WhatsApp, I mean, those are social network in some way, I mean, they were not defined as social networks, but you know, we might think about, you know, there might be future competitors to, to Amazon, of course. Um, contestability is very important, and that has been mentioned uh, by Philippe. Um, contestability is basically the idea that, you know, we have no choice, we are going to end up with monopolies or tight oligopolies. Um, and what's important is not to try to create competition, artificial competition, but rather you should try to make sure that if you have efficient entrants, uh, they will be able to enter uh, and they won't be blocked by, by the incumbents. And if that's the case, actually, <laughs> Drew Fudenberg and I wrote a paper on that 20 years ago, um, it might actually induce actually the incumbents uh, to charge low prices so as to build a big installed base of consumers and also to innovate. Now, this is a very ad idealized thing, so uh, we don't really believe in it, of course. And let me add one thing, is that often if you look at how people enter, how firms enter a market, they don't enter the entire <laughs> set of segments. They're not like Amazon or Google today, actually. Google started with just a very market niche, which was a search engine, or Amazon was selling books. It's not the Amazon of today, so you enter on a market niche and then you you expand, and Uber is try just trying to do that, of course, and, and they all try to do that. Um, so it's very important to, to pay attention to, to tie-ins, to bundling, um, or in a milder version, preference for own services. It's important to check uh, possibilities for multi-homing. Um, and there are lots of things we have to look, uh, look at. I and mean, economists have looked at a lot at uh, best price guarantees, the most favored nation clauses which almost every platform uses, right? Um, which looks good on paper. You know, you know when you teach your students, uh, you say, watch out, you know, intuition is not always the right thing. So you give them your best price guarantees. Booking is going to tell you, I have all the hotels on my website and you'll get the lowest price on the platform. I mean, you cannot imagine a better deal. Except that, except that, of course, that once you can offer that because you have asked for a best price guarantee from the hotel, um, then the consumer is going to be totally loyal to you and you are going to have unique customers. And then you can go and see the hotel and say you have to pay 25% if you want to reach my customers. And that has nothing to do with market share. I mean, people think it's market share that counts in that case, but 
Not at all, actually. If you have one percent of the market, that's enough. You're a monopolist on, on all your customers. So that's the kind of thing you teach to the students just so that they, they get the intuition that intuition is actually not always the right thing to, to use. Um, but, you know, this is very important. Uh, we have had cases uh, in, in Germany, for example, in France. Amazon has had cases, of course. They all use most favored nation clauses. Uh, um, so unless you intervene, uh, they are going to keep using that and ransom, basically, uh, all the merchants, and that's what, what they do. And they also bring a very nice service. I mean, it's not like we should expropriate them either. But it's going to be all over the place. So how many of you have a personal assistant? Alexia or Google Home? Okay. <laughs> wow, this is, this is lots of Europeans, I guess, because in the US it's very big. Okay. Alexia is not sold yet, no. But Google Home is. And, uh, and you, it's pretty scary, by the way, in terms of privacy, but <laughs> that's another matter. Um, but of course, you know, the most favored nation clause is going to play a big role because you say, Alexia, find me a doctor my, for my foot or you know, whatever, you know, deliver me that meal or something like that. And you know, they will, probably you won't have Google Home and Alexia at home, you won't multi-home, right? You'll just have one of them and you'll be a unique customer, and, and then you, know, you can ask 35% from the doctor to be referred uh, by, by Alexia. So, you know, th that's the kind of thing you have to think about, and, um, and that's important. And let me just say a little bit about data. I mean, uh, as an economist, I find it overwhelming to think about privacy. I have no clue what my behavior entails, and I have no time to read. And those, those terms and conditions are pretty awful if you look at them. And what I do, honestly, is I click. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a bit hyperbolic too, but you know, I want the information, I click, I click, I click. And of course, you know, I just sell my entire family and home. But you know, <laughs> I think there's a point where the rational consumer, I, I, I think of myself pretty rational actually, but you know, at some point, you know, I have only limited time and limited knowledge. So, you know, libertarian paternalism appeals to me. You know, I need help from the regulator somehow. Uh, I don't want to kill innovation, but I, I need a set of simple policies I can choose from. Uh, maybe by default, I don't know, but at the same time, it should not be free. So for example, if I'm using Waze and I say, oh, I don't want to be recorded, okay? Then nobody, you know, it's a free option. Then nobody is going to be recorded by Waze, and then Waze will be totally useless, right? Because there will be no data in it. So you have to find the right, the right solution somehow. It's, it's not, it should not be a free lunch either. But um, we need help. We need help from the regulator, so that you know you keep the innovation, but you get rid of the bad aspects. And I think uh, that will be my conclusion. I mean. I, I'm very excited about this roundtable, about this conference, uh, because you know we, there's so much we have to do uh, f for the next 50 years. If we want to, you know, it's a, it's a new world, and you know we are not quite ready for that. I will, we, you, we could talk about fiscal matters as well. Actually, Philip mentioned that. You know, we could talk about privacy. We could talk all about all those things. We, we now have to get to grips with uh, all those questions. So let me first ask uh, the three panelists whether they want to reply to each other. You know, I, wa I was very happy with uh, Werner Steng uh, orientation for regulation because uh, I think that we need, and we need help and we need the regulation. I don't have to define it because I am a member of the play game, but we need help and, and I, I feel very happy that the commission is entering this uh, new exercise of uh, setting new regulation. I think it's very positive. We also need help, uh, but, but, <laughs> we <can't laughs> but we can't admit it openly. <laughs> no, no, no questions at this stage. <laughs> Okay, so I suggest we, we open the discussion to the floor. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions.
Could you speak up, yeah, please? Maybe we should, uh, I'll pass around the microphone to Judy. So what is the name of the assistant in Google Home? What's his name, her name? Uh, it's OK Google. Oh, OK Google. I see. It's, okay, it's, it's generic, neutered. Um, you know, it, to the French, it might be difficult. There's no law or law in this case. Um, well, I had a question for you based on uh, the algorithmic complexity. I mean, in some sense, the, the deep learning algorithms are intended to maximize a multidimensional space. If it's the case that collusion maximizes that, why should we be ever be surprised that collusion wouldn't be the result? Uh, matter of fact, I could even envision cases where there are incredibly sophisticated collusion strategies that are extremely difficult to detect. Imagine, for example, that you have an Amazon AI working with an uh, Alibaba AI. Now, I don't have to experiment on an expensive de device like signaling with an iPhone, which is a high price item. I might signal on a penny candy item that I'm willing to collude, in which case my costs of learning or probing the other AI are very small. But it's such a high dimensional space that ever testing that probing could be extremely difficult. But then now they start colluding on cross of lots of different dimensions. So I'm, I'm surprised that we would be surprised that these algorithms wouldn't find the collusive outcomes. And I, uh, I think we need to think more carefully about the end result rather than the inputs. Yes, I think at the moment the technology is not yet there. So what I showed you is, uh, so these algorithms, they don't know anything. So they're versatile because they're model free. They don't know, they don't even know that they're competing against somebody else. And so my take is that um, maybe um, 10 to 15 years from now, uh, when whoever is coding these algorithms realizes that giving them more contextual information is helping them, um, then in that case, I would expect these kind of outcomes to emerge. Uh, for us, it was a surprise because it was a simple, it was a very simple naked version of, uh, of the technology. But I think we're getting there. Uh, we'll get there at some point. question for La Poste. Uh, so if La Poste is, uh, you said, is an actionopatarian uh, organization, then is there any presumption that La Poste were to compete with Amazon without regulation? Is there any presumption that La Poste will lose the competition to Amazon? That is, in other words, why La Poste can be more innovative than Amazon and, and win the competition? Mm. I, is there any efforts La Poste is doing, like, um, alternative method, delivery method, like drones um, or others? No, in, in fact, the need for regulation is not a need for protection. And, and I like your question. I think that uh, even in Toulouse, as Amazon has now organized a delivery platform here in your town, we will win the competition against Amazon. But the issue is not on delivery where we will win the competition. Uh, the issue is that Amazon is connecting a lot of market, not only the delivery market, but also the, pla the market platform market, but also the Alexia at home, but also Amazon Web Services, and so on and so on. So we don't fear the competition, and as mentioned, we will win in Toulouse and in delivery. Clearly, because we have a good organization of that. The issue is the market power and the concentration of market power. That is why. At the same time, I told you, and I sincerely uh, believe it, they are stimulating us, which is, uh, in fact, uh, the role of competition. We like competition. We were an ancient monopoly, and we are very happy to be out of this monopoly situation. However, the concentration of market power is a big issue, not only for La Poste. So on drones, we have a drone a commercial service in the south of France. It exists today with uh, La Poste. We are working uh, on that for some of the uh, small French islands to use uh, drones for that. So my need for regulation was a need for uh, fair competition, not a demand 
for protection, to be as clear as possible. I have a question for Bernard Stein. You, in your speech, you mentioned that regulation should go in the direction of avoiding situations in which someone is kicked out of the platform uh, for no reason. But just for a clarification, would you mean that there should be the regulation should establish some minimum uh, security for uh, participants, or you, it's more that it should be transparent from the beginning? And, yeah. Yeah, it works. Um, it, is, it is the latter. It is about transparency and predictability. We are not interfering at this stage with business models per se. We're not saying these are the rules. We impose the rules on the game on you. You know, these is blacklisted clauses and this is gray and this is white and what have you because we wouldn't know how to do that, frankly. Yeah? A platform can freely decide and should be free to decide who it wants on its, on its platform. Yeah? It just has to be crystal clear from the outset. I'll give you one example. But probably you know the Etsy website, Etsy, ETSI, uh, American-based, it's for handicraft products. That's huge. And that's sort of the, the Lithuanian lady that's, you know, with, with handmade stockings could sell it through Etsy to some wealthy American elderly lady or what have you. Um, of course, Etsy can say we only want handicraft. Yeah? So the moment uh, you start selling Chinese-made mass, you know, mass-manufactured stuff, I'm, as Etsy, I am and I should remain to be entitled to kick you off the next moment. Yeah? So that's why we don't want to say what is allowed and what is not allowed. Yeah? It's, a, it's a platform decision like any other business. I mean, any other business and sector of the economy, if we were trying to tell them what they're allowed to do and what they're not, they would say, are you crazy? You know, this is the market economy. So what we are trying, what we are trying to, 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 to ensure is that from the, from the start, it's clear what the rules of the game are, uh, that you are properly and immediately informed on the grounds for the listing, and that you have a chance to challenge that decision. That is what we are doing. <coughs> Just to, to follow up on that, uh, there are always things you cannot specify ex ante, right? And you know, you, there are some characters you don't want to have on your platform. There are products you know are not going to sell and are going to encumber the, you know, the landscape in your, on your platform. So uh, you want to kick them out, even so somehow they, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they won't be profitable at all, or they may even discourage users from joining the platform. <laughs> so uh, that, but that, uh, the, then you need a dispute resolution mechanism, which is what you say. And you, how do you envision this dispute resolution mechanism? Who is going to do it? Is that going to be the European Commission? <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> Starting still from the first part of your question, um, of course we cannot anticipate each and every situation, as but it's even clear. Even the platform itself. Yeah. Even the platform itself. But th there are two things. Yeah, first is sort of the policy of the platform, which of course it can describe more or less precisely. Um, but quality criteria would be one of those. Yeah, I said, I don't want this type of, of business on my... You could say, well, if, if you don't consistently uh, reply to consumer requests within two days or deliver within two weeks, then you can, s you can specify all sort of quality criteria to protect your reputation as a platform. All of that is, is very legitimate to the extent that the user knows that. Or if it is coming back to the fake news, uh, it's Facebook that decides what it wants and allows on its website. It's the terms and conditions. Of course, there's always the limit of what is illegal that needs to go down, but there's a lot of legal stuff that Facebook removes every, every second because they say we don't want uh, naked bodies and this, that, and the other. You know, it's, it's still their choice, their business. Yeah? Now, in terms of redress, as I said before, it's, it's, it's first it's really internal to the platform. Yeah? The needs, they need to set in place a mechanism. It's much, more, it's much more defined in terms of objectives than in how exactly they should do this. We're not saying there needs to be a human interface that interacts within 24 hours. You know, we don't want to micromanage a fast-moving environment. Yeah? We, we want to be technologically neutral. But we're saying that it, it needs to be a complaint handling mechanism that allows to solve and discuss those situations in, in a timely and effective manner. Yeah? So it's more uh, principle-based and, and results-oriented legislation than prescriptive on the half. The other two levels are, as I said, outside the platforms. Yeah? Uh, that we promote mediation and there's a strong obligation on platforms to engage in mediation. 
because that has proven to be very powerful where it exists. And the third thing is really uh, the, the real enforcement threat will be that associations can take platforms into court in Europe because they are not doing what this regulation requires them to do. So this is the escalation, if you want, of, of redress. <coughs> I have a, a question for them also. Um, there's a lot, it seems to be so, so large, this uh, field of regulation between, uh, uh, well, with the operation of platforms, like privacy, like uh, uh, fiscality, like uh, level playing fields, uh, respect of uh, uh, different laws. Um, do you feel you, you have enough means to regulate or to, to be able to construct something around this regulation? Isn't there a, a problem of, of, uh, uh, of, of means for the European Commission? And two years ago, we published a policy document on online platforms, setting out our general strategy, if you want. That it was in April or May 2016. At that stage, we had already described the platform economy and how it works and what it is, the challenges arising from it. And one of the policy conclusions was that we refrain <coughs> from proposing an all-encompassing platform regulation that solves all the evil in this world. Yeah. So in that sense, we have opted more for a sort of targeted issue by issue, problem by problem uh, response to that. Yeah? The challenge arising from that is then of course ensure coherence between the different things. Yeah? But for instance, if you look even into platform definitions, they differ between different initiatives because we're addressing different issues. So when I'm talking about those dependencies between sellers and buyers, I have a very different scope and I have, as I said before, from marketplaces, e-commerce marketplaces to app stores to Facebook, uh, it's more a functional definition of the intermediation function yeah, between business and consumers. But as uh, other initiatives that aim for digital taxation, for instance, for them, this entry point is not relevant because the underlying problem is different. So we're always starting really from sort of a problem analysis of what is the issue, who is concerned, and then we try to find a policy response rather than to say there is this uniform body of platforms, they're all the same, you know, and all bad, and let's now regulate them to death. Yeah, so, but it's, it's very tricky because it also means that we have to make the case intervention by intervention and, and of course, discuss, discuss with all the member states and with parliament, um, and, but that's European lawmaking. I can't change that. Um, for John, for John, um, you mentioned that uh, much of uh, welfare economics was down the drain, and I was wondering um, if you meant that because of the predominance of platforms or some other reason, and if you could give a couple examples of that, and also what are the implications of that uh, dearth of welfare economic thinking for regulation, since I have trouble imagining regulation without some kind of something like that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, of course, we are, we are not destroying everything that we built uh, over the years, but, uh, but it's true if you, if you look at uh, the market definition, for example. Uh, we have been trying to convince the antitrust authorities to think in terms of two-sided markets, right? And not, because on one side of the market, you'll be ch you know, charging monopoly prices, and the other side, you'll be uh, charging velo prices. Uh, uh, you, you might think it's exercise of monopoly power and on the other side predation when it, you might be perfectly competitive in the end. So, you know, that kind of thing and, you know, the most fair nation stuff uh, also tells you the market shares uh, make even less sense than before. So I it's more like a matter of degree, I think. Uh, uh, price regulation, same thing, and, you know, you want, what, what price cap do you want to impose? I mean, you know, all those platforms charge zero on the number of services, right? How do you deal with that? Uh, I'm not even mentioning profit regulation or cost of service regulation. I mean, uh, we don't know how to do it. And then the international aspects are added up to that. So uh, there is a very strong need for regulation, but I, I'm very much in line with, uh, with Werner that you have to find ways of having a regulation which is both powerful and non-intrusive, right? We don't want to second guess the companies. But we have to, to make sure, given that we are going to have all those monopolies and we have to live with them. And you know, let's not try to create fake competition. Let's 
let's try to make sure that only the efficient entrants enter. But for that, there are some conditions, and we, we have to design this. So that's a challenge for us, I would think. Um. Okay, Verena, sorry, back to you. Um, if on, on cross-border parcels like TBD, I, I prefer uh, ex post uh, regulation, for sure we, we need uh, an ex-ante one for the, uh, uh, for the platforms. Um, and and you, you, you started commenting about the time it will take. Um, I mean, the, the, the yeah, the timing of, of uh, legislation in Europe. But um, th there is kind of emergency here because um, when, when we talk to our customers, the, the platforms, the non-Amazon uh, platform, <coughs> they are scared. They, 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 are, they are really um, feeling that uh, the competition is, is too tough. And uh, some are pushed to find some alliances to try and resist. And um, the, the um, uh, I said already sometimes that uh, um, if, if, if we are not quick enough, um, in some years, uh, Europe could be the place where Alibaba and uh, Amazon uh, fight together, but uh, no more European uh, operator uh, in the middle. Um, second question. Um, at the end of your intervention, you said um, uh, we need help, and, and I, uh, we know each other for a long time. I, I know it's just not by chance you said that. So um, here, what, what could you, what do you, could you expect from the economies or from the post uh, to help? Yeah, first on the timing. Um, People are afraid and competition is tough. Um, first of all, we're not against competition per se, yeah? And, and, and as, as Mr. Valley rightly said, um, you don't want to be protected, mm -hmm. um, but you want to be probably empowered or you want others having to play by the rules uh, rather than be protecting you. So our first instinct is not to stifle competition and innovation because people are complaining. I mean, I'm not downplaying it with my own story, yeah? But I mean, you saw this also in the collaborative economy space. Whenever something new hits something old, the old protests, uh, and the old usually has a stronger lobbying power. Uh, and so if taxes are threatened by Uber and hotels are threatened by Airbnb, that pretty much quickly tends to come up a legislative response, very often at member state level, by the way, faster than we do that. Um, so we, we want to be a bit careful as well in that we don't shoot from the hip before knowing actually whom we are going to kill. Yeah? And that's just a normal reflex and a healthy one, I think. Now, on this specific proposal, I mean, we are approaching the end of the mandate. I mean, that's, that's very much Brussels talk now, yeah? But whenever the parliament and the, the commission terms end, and that's next year, mid of next year, that is usually when ongoing files need to be closed. So starting negotiations now, beginning of May, gives me a year to negotiate that. Um, if that goes through, that's pretty fast, because also regulation, which means directly binding, la, la, la and uh, will enter into force after a few months after that. So if, if I get parliament and member states on board, and there is a likelihood of that happening, because what you said is of course true, yeah? And this is when I talk to member states already now, to many of them, um, to, to a greater or uh, lesser extent, they are agreeing with our analysis, uh, and same parliament, so the negotiations will be more on the, on, you know, a bit more here, a bit less there, but it could be for once that Brussels comes. And it's the first worldwide, first platform regulation of this kind, yeah, looking into. So I know we're always slow, uh, but I'd rather be slow and get it right than, than kill anything else. What was the second question again? <laughs> how can we help? Oh, okay, how can we help, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that is a very good question. Um, we talked a bit about, uh, you know, a, a lot actually about artificial intelligence and algorithms and this, that, and the other. Um, and I also ended my first intervention by saying, uh, we first need to monitor, we need to observe, we need research, we need to understand what's going on, yeah? And this is precisely where people like yourselves in this room come in. And I was encouraging research already presented this morning, which of course only looked at very, you know, as, as you would have to do in an individual project, it would always be 
narrowly circumscribed and then there's 25 assumptions that limits its, uh, its value at the end of the day to draw policy conclusions. But the more of this there is and the more you build on previous colleagues' works and try to, to, to bring light into this because that's the main problem we are having is nobody understands what's going on and that's also what scares people, by the way, also citizens. Yeah? If, if you think into algorithms, increasingly they take decisions. They take decisions on how much we pay for things, you know, whether I use an iPhone or an, an Android or what have you, where I live, uh, um, they decide whether or not I get insurance cover. I mean, it, you can extrapolate that, whether I get a loan. Or, uh, they will increasingly take many, many decisions for us, and people don't know how these decisions are taken. Now, we will not be able to open up algorithms and, and you know, like a dead animal. Um, so we need to think about how we can make things more transparent and more accountable. Uh, and the transparency is first, how, how does this work actually? Yeah, and, and what can the, the results at the end be explained and how can they be explained? Uh, so the more research in all of these issues uh, is done, the more confident will we feel. I mean, just la la last remark on this, you, Jean, you mentioned MFN clauses now repeatedly. Um, even there, uh, how, no matter how intuitive it may be or not, uh, currently, the evidence is still inconclusive about the welfare effects of this. Competition authorities all over Europe, including the Commission, have looked into those hotel price parity clauses, uh, exercise price booking. Until today, there is no clear conclusion what the ultimate welfare effect on consumers is. Is it actually good or bad? It's not clear, although people may think, well, that's obvious. Yeah? So that's one reason, by the way, where also in this regulation we have not banned uh, MFN clauses but forced platforms to, to be more explicit about those. So there's almost no area of data, including where not more research would be absolutely wanted. Well, let, let me just respond a little bit on the MFNs. Uh, I, I think it's also our fault as economists not to have designed policies. Um, and we are probably, you know, we may think 25% may be too much, but is that 14% of 12% or 20%? We have no clue, honestly. For credit cards, we did that. We, we had a rule which is called the tourist test, which basically gives, a, so, which is used by the European Union, uh, which actually tells you, you know, how much you can surcharge, for example, you know, and a per pound. And the M MFNs are not completely, you know, inefficient either. They also try to prevent showrooming. Uh, you know, you go onto booking and then you know it's going to be cheaper on the hotel website and then you go to the hotel website and booking that's a reverse, it's completely expropriated from its investment. So, you know, and I think it's up to us economists and, and understand the help here um, to actually come up with rules. So, so far we have used, you know, limited MFNs or no MFNs uh, like in France and, you know, but it's not, those are not perfect rules and I, I, I completely uh, agree with that. Let me just uh, push a little bit on transparency. So you mentioned Alibaba, but Alibaba uh, lending is lending a lot to SMEs. It's lending a lot to SMEs because uh, Chinese uh, state-owned banks uh, basically uh, are instructed to lend to state-owned firms. <laughs> and, uh, and Alibaba does its SME lending uh, mostly through you know, artificial intelligence. There is no people actually granting the loan. It's actually the way it works. And often those loans are about you know, $2,000 or less, or $3,000 or less. Uh, you know, millions, you know, millions of loans. Actually, I don't remember how many SMEs they have, but it, it's a huge number. Um, what's bad about that? I mean, if you make it transparent, then the entire business model, I don't want to defend Alibaba, but you know, the entire business model is, is actually becomes public and then you know, it loses a competitive advantage. And so that raises the question, there must be some market failure in your mind uh, saying, you know, if it's a machine who does it, which does, I said, who, yeah, which does it, um, you know, there will be something wrong. You know, and, and, and that's something, there might be cases, uh, but you know, it may not always be wrong, no? No, clearly not, and I don't have anything on my mind, probably also because it's Friday evening. Um, <laughs> on, on algorithms, for instance, yeah? Um, we're just launching now, as we speak, a one and a half year project sponsored by the European Parliament that also said algorithms are very important. 
Uh, and there we are going in without without any preconceived ideas or solutions. Yeah, we are with with the chosen consultants and the very and the large inbuilt stakeholder involvement process because we don't expect any single expert or group of experts to have the answers. So we, to look into the space and to see what are the challenges, the issues arising from 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 algorithms, yeah, and algorithmic transparency, and from that gradually then distill a few issues and then see whether some response is needed. The same for artificial intelligence in the same uh, end of April package I was referring to. There will also be a paper on artificial intelligence, but it's not coming with solutions, but but starting a bit the debate and, 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 and raising the awareness on some of the challenges and issues. So this is on all of these issues, uh, at least at the European level, we are very cautiously trying to, to find some light in the, in the dark. No preconceived solutions. I understand it's Friday afternoon. Uh, but I'm sure there are more questions because we have those three great uh, participants and I'm sure you have questions for them. No? Okay. So we have to call it a day. I first would like to thank a lot uh, Emilio and Philippe and Werner for, for this great contribution. Thanks so much.